welcome back to another episode of HBO Max. I'm your host, McKenna. Joining me as always is my co-host, Brandon. How are you today, Brandon? Oh, uh, it's Labor Day. We're Yay. taking a taking a long weekend, which is exciting. Love a long weekend. Yeah. How, I mean, obviously, how... it's not Labor Day while you're listening to the this no. podcast, but today while we're recording it, yeah, long weekend. <laughs> how was your Labor Day weekend? <laughs> Um, it was pretty good. Uh, I spent most of yesterday just in my room watching movies and stuff. And I got, I watched the new Lord of the Rings show. Oh, I've heard about that. Mm. I haven't read or watched any Lord of the Rings, but I've heard it's pretty decent. Uh, The movie's pretty, pretty good. The shows, it seems okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was like two episodes and nothing happened, but you know. (laughs) Yeah, so I was a little I was a little bored while watching it. Um, they're messing with the timeline a little bit, and it bothers Uh-oh. me. Uh-oh. Anatar, the Lord of Gifts, hasn't shown up yet. He might not show up. If he doesn't, show's not worth watching. <laughs> we 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 here at HBO Max don't like when they mess with the timeline. Um, oh no, no, we don't. <laughs> Um, I don't have a good segue. We watched Pulp Fiction this episode. It's Film Bro Month. It's Film Bro Month. We have themes. We're so official now. Yeah, it's a real podcast. It's a real podcast. It only took a year and a half, but we're yeah. we're officially a real podcast. Our schedule's worse than it's ever been right now, but we're oh yeah, <laughs> but we're real. Yeah. M- McKenna's doing freelance work and. <laughs> I've all over the place. My work schedule just changed. So, yeah, we're getting episodes out very slowly and randomly, but we're very official with we're our. We're official. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> we have theme months, so it's yeah. okay now. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so we're going to spend the next month reviewing film bro classics, mm-hmm. such as today's Pulp Fiction by Quentin Tarantino, mm-hmm. which, uh, like for a lot of people, was one of the first, like, real movies i ever saw oh yeah interesting oh this is the first time i've seen it yeah (laughs) um yeah no that's what a way to start off a monday i was doing laundry (laughs) (laughs) i didn't know a single thing about the plot of this movie i knew who was in it i knew the director i knew it's like people like it it's hard to like people don't really talk about the plot right because it's right. hard to explain like what it the is. movies because it's not really about like any one thing in particular mm-hmm. yeah yeah it's 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 a lot of crisscross which i really like i love i love when things crisscross with each other and like it, it's well, like this a- is this is the movie that sort of put the non-narrative storytelling like on the Ooh, map like like this is probably like the first major film that did like like messing with time, mm-hmm. things bouncing around when the story is being told. Because mm-hmm. um, yeah, uh, oof, uh, I, why, uh, the first time I was very confused about what was going on in this movie. <laughs> yeah, I can. Yeah, I I went to look up. While I was watching it, I went to look up the Wikipedia plot, and I know there was there were numbers, and I was like, "I'm not. I'll read this afterwards if I'm still confused, because I don't want to." Oh yeah, yeah, they got a whole like narrative structure about where things go. Yeah, that's yeah. Crazy. <laughs> I was like, like twenty minutes. I was like, I, I, I'm just gonna read like the first sentence to make sure that like my brain is following. And then I realized, uh, no, this is. I'm just gonna keep watching the movie and see where it takes me, and I, I figured it out in the end. Although yeah, like like you said, it is the the timeline is sort of it bounces around a lot because um, like it explains in on the Wikipedia page with the numbers it's like one and seven and then it's like two or six it's it's all the numbers yeah because all. the 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 movie's book ended by the what happens in the diner yeah but that mm-hmm. is actually after. Uh, it's it's because it's in the <laughs> Vincent's story. It's in between that mm-hmm. everything right. up until where they the the miracle happens, and then it jumps forward to where they show up at the bar after the finale of the movies happened, and then they they introduce Butch there, mm-hmm. and Butch comes back around later. Yes, 
um yeah it's 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 really a head trip the first like time you watch it because mm-hmm. like um especially because like at the beginning like the with the whole thing with the diner it's just like a non sequitur like you have no idea why it was in the movie right and then yeah. you get to the end and they're they're in the diner and then all of a sudden you hear uh the the lady s- scream <laughs> and it's like oh oh no we're in the thing <laughs> It's happening. Uh, yeah. It's, I liked that. It was fun to put it together at the end about when things happen when. Vince I, just dies halfway through the movie? Yeah, I know. That threw, that threw me off because then, of course, we go back to... Like, he dies, and then we immediately come back to when he's alive. And it's just it's like, yeah. oh, okay. I see where this is. All right. Yeah, no. It's, it's making sense. Um... Like, when does... No, okay, wait. Let me go over the facts and figures before I start asking okay, questions. Okay, okay. Yeah, let's do facts and figures. <laughs> okay! Pulp Fiction released October. That's what the 10th month is. October 14th, 1994. Had a budget of 8 to $8.5 million. Made it back. Box office, 2.3. Nope. 213.9 million. Wow. I really can't read tonight. Um... The it had seven Oscar nominations, including uh, Best Picture, which it lost to Forrest Gump, and uh, but it did win Best Original Screenplay. Um, this it, this was the year nineteen ninety four where the Best Picture category was absolutely stacked. Yeah, I yeah, it's insane. Because yeah, Forrest Gump won, mm-hmm. but like Goodfellas was nominated for Best mm-hmm. Picture, Pulp Fiction, Shawshank Redemption. Mm-hmm. It's like one of the best all time like Best Picture categories, and uh, probably the least deserving movie ended up winning. <laughs> but oh. you know that's the way it normally works. <laughs> be like that um in 2013 it was selected for preservation in the u.s uh, national film registry by library of congress in november of 2021 tarantino released seven nfts based on uncut slash unseen footage which miramax uh threw a lawsuit down and was like yo we own the rights and tarantino was like but i own the script rights um it's all. I don't know, it's terrible. Did that get resolved at all, or is? I don't. It did. It just no. I don't know. It didn't say. Is they have? I mean, it's been almost a year, so I'm assuming something else happened. But um, yeah. Oh yeah, because he it is it, he did just put out its handwritten parts of the script. Mm-hmm. So yeah, they can't do anything about that. He owns yeah. the script. It's his publishing rights. Yeah. So, boom. 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 <laughs> NFTs. Uh, the uh, Malibu, Vincent's car, uh, was actually Tarantino's, and it was stolen during production, and it was found in 2013 when some kids were stripping it for parts, and someone thought it was suspicious, looked at the v- the VIN number, and was like, oh shit, it's Tarantino's car <laughs> from <Wow. laughs> 94. <laughs> oh, that's really cool. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting. It's a nice car. That's a sweet car. It is. Did, did you were you able to figure out who keyed the car when I, you were watching I, it? I I I read it in the IMDb. It was but I didn't pick it up the first time. But yeah, because I've either. seen this movie like a million times, like so many right. times. And yeah, it's one of those things that you pick it up like when once you understand where the timeline is. It's like, oh yeah, he was a jerk to Butch, and then Butch went out and keyed his car. <laughs> Um, the word fuck is said 265 times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, it was, I have always heard about, like, um, th- that, you know, that one movie that s- says it a lot, but I couldn't remember that it was Pulp Fiction, and then, like, one of, like, I watched on Am, no, I, I totally watched on HBO Max, um, I was reading the IMDb, <laughs> and one of the first facts was, um, <laughs> The, that it was said to I was like, oh, it's that movie. Oh, this should be fun. I will say I did have a very, like, brain dead moment because I watched this, like, one of the first things I did in the morning was I, I put this movie on. I watched about half of it. Then I went and made breakfast, came back a little bit later, watched the second half. Um, I woke up this morning. I was like, okay, I got to watch Pulp Fiction again for the podcast. What streaming service is it on? What do I, I loaded up Netflix first, and I was like, 
<laughs> it's HBO Max. The show is <laughs> HBO Max. <laughs> it's, it happens, you know? Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> there's a lot of streaming services out there. Yeah, I need to buy a new copy of this movie. I don't think it's come out on 4K Blu-ray yet. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I had one of the anniversary DVDs was the first way I watched it, which was like, so it, it, it like, you know, the movie and then it just had like a second disc of like a, um, a documentary about like the making of the movie and stuff like that. It was, I think it was like a 10th anniversary DVD. Mm-hmm. I would like to, I would like to get a good copy of a, a Blu-ray of it that had that document because that documentary is really interesting because it immediately like. I learned about Reservoir Dogs from watching that and then immediately went and watched Reservoir Dogs. Yeah. There you go. Neat movie. I like the the poster. Yeah. It's it's iconic. It's one of those... It's one of the the covers that I remember from the blockbuster back in the day when Mm. I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And there would be like... There would be like a couple walls of like classic films or like on like... um, What do you call them? Uh like the ends of the aisle where oh. they would like set aside some some movies and it was one of the it was like that fight club uh fear and loathing in las vegas mm-hmm. like these um adaptation like the ones that sit on those walls were like those movies and those posters are like ingrained into my brain yeah seeing pulp fiction there, i was always like what the hell is that movie about <laughs> yeah and now, like, I, I like looking, I looked at it after I watched it, and I, like, noticed all the details. Like, oh, I get it. Yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff going on in it. Mm-hmm. That's Zuma Thurman. So, I mean, you can't go wrong. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I, I have, um, a few years ago, I got a puzzle with a bunch of, like, movie posters on it. And, like, that that was obviously one of them. So, I was like, oh. That's how I know it was a good one. It made the puzzle. Um... Samuel L. Jackson flipping the table in the scene at the beginning. Um, when they're in the apartment. Yes. It was improvised. Um, those were all genuine reactions, and they can sin- continue with the scene all in one take because it was. Yeah, that makes it. I bet it'd be super hard to reset. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just casually thrown table. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> um, Vincent Vega was originally written for Michael Madsen. Um, mm-hmm. But he already signed on for a different movie. So then um, John Travolta got it. Which is weird because... Well, it's not weird. Never mind. This is my own... I only know John Travolta is Danny in Greece, So this was very Okay, bizarre. so I, I had a prop Ooh. that I was going to grab. And I forgot to grab it. So one second. <laughs> oh, this is... Uh, oh, um, bam. Oh, thank God. He's back already. So... Uh, the reason John Travolta got the role is because one of Quentin Tarantino's five favorite movies of all time, which he's talked about a bunch, is this movie right here, Blowout, by uh, Brian De Palma. This is my Criterion copy. It's very course. good. It's on HBO Max as well. You should check it out. Um, set in Philadelphia, McKenna. Oh, I know about that place. Also, yeah, the, the, the Criterion cover of this is just so cool. That John Travolta cool. sitting there. Um, really cool. But um, at this point, in 94 john travolta's career was like essentially like considered like over he was very much at like like he had just got done doing the uh look who's talking movies about you know the talking baby and the talking dog and all that kind of thing (laughs) and like he didn't really have any star power left anymore but tarantino remembered him from doing blowout as like a serious this is like a thriller that he's he's really really good in it and obviously uh, other De Palma movies that he's in like Carrie and stuff and so he always wanted to work with John Travolta and when um because originally it was supposed to be Michael Madsen as a joke because it's in this movie he played it's Vincent Vega in his previous film Reservoir Dogs Michael Madsen plays uh Vic Vega mm-hmm. And so it was a joke that it's the Vega brothers and they look exactly the same. It's it's supposed to be a little gag. But then it ended up just being a separate character um, with Travolta in it. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. That's- and then for a long time, he had talked about he wanted to do a movie called Double V Vega with Michael <gasps> Madsen and John Travolta together as the Vega brothers. Because both of them die at the end of their movies. So getting yeah. getting them together would... Be pretty neat yeah i read that it was supposed to be a prequel but they were already 
too old to play younger versions of themselves. So. Yeah, they, there was a bunch of things where like he had it, he had the idea and stuff, but he never really got like a script together or anything. Yeah, by mm -hmm. the time Michael Madsen and uh, John Travolta both didn't age particularly well, they're very obviously older by the time that they really got the idea going. Ah, <laughs> uh, al alas. Before. He's talked about doing books and stuff. I would. It would be cool Ooh. if he put out Double V Vega as a book. That'd be cool. Has Quentin Tarantino written books before? So he just put out, well, a couple years ago now, I think, but he put out a um, a novelization of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood that he wrote. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's kind of a fun book because it's written like as sort of like a, kind of like a joke about like novelizations of movies mm -hmm. and stuff, how like they'll add stuff or they'll be, you know, because a lot of times like a novelization comes out, um, it comes out like at the same time the movie does, right? Mm -hmm. And the way that they're able to get that to work is that the writer for the book is basing it off like the first draft of the script. So a lot of time there'll be inconsistencies between them because uh. things have been changed from the initial script to the final script. And so there's jokes like that in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, stuff that he like took out of the movie and stuff like that. I haven't read it, but I've heard it's pretty fun. Ooh, that's fun. That does sound fun. I haven't seen that movie, but this should be a good time. Well, yeah, this was this was your first Tarantino directed film. Yes, it is. It was very exciting. It was. I'll watch more of them. They're pretty good. It was pretty good. <laughs> it's a pretty good movie. Um, speaking of Quentin Tarantino, or I guess is what his role in this movie, in terms of acting role, uh, Steve Buscemi was supposed to play Jimmy, mm -hmm. who was later played, uh, but he had to refuse it because of something else. I can't, I didn't write down why. Um, but Jim, the other, Jeff Goldblum was, and Bill Paxson were also considered for the role of Jimmy. So, Quinn Tarantino and the man who plays Lance, who his, the actor's name is escaping me, they had to choose between who was going oh, to play Lance and um, who was going to play Jimmy. Lance is, oh, what's his name? He's, he's the original Marty McFly. Oh, um, shit, that's... Eric okay. Stoltz. Yes, yes. Yeah. Oh! <gasps> oh, get out. Yeah, they, so they had to choose between um, uh, who played Jimmy and who played Lance. And Quentin Tarantino wanted to have more direction during Mia's overdose scene. So then that Eric makes sense. Stoltz had to play Lance. Um, and then my final fact and figure. Um, out of the $8 million budget... To eight and a half million. One hundred fifty thousand um, dollars was built or was taken to build the Jackrabbit Slim set, which I just thought was cool because <sighs> that's a cool set. I was wondering. I never really looked into that, but I was watching it today. And I was like, I wonder if that's like a thing that they built or if that's a real thing that that's just yeah. He just built a restaurant. That's funny. <laughs> no, but for 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 the portion. Great. I mean the the dancing scene. I mean that's like the one thing that I knew going into this movie. That mm -hmm. out of like the scenes that I'd seen. So, I mean, it's pretty, I suppose it's iconic enough, but. Yeah, the the dancing scene is a reference to the um, the Godard film, uh, A Band Apart. Oh, okay. the, however you say it in French, I'm not going to try. <laughs> um, but that's, um, that movie is what Tarantino named his production company, A Band Apart. Oh, it's, it's like okay. A Bon Depart or whatever it is in French. But yeah, so they copied parts of the uh, the dance sequence from that movie and put it into this one. Oh. And there are there are a couple other like French New Wave like um, kind of like references like when um, when Butch leaves the fight and gets in the car when mm -hmm. they sh it's got like the old school like um, rear projection thing mm -hmm. going on in there, which is mm -hmm. it's the only time they, they there's a lot of stuff shot in cars in this movie and it's the only time that they do that for some reason. <laughs> there's a lot of decisions made in this movie. There there were a lot of decisions made in this movie. Um, let's talk about the movie. Yeah, let's talk about the movie. Look at that segue. Yeah. Boom. Um but a movie. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot that happened. It's it's a whole lot of movie. It's it's a whole lot of movie that I wasn't expecting, but I'm not necessarily upset about it. It was good. I yeah. enjoyed it. Yeah. Um I will say the guy's head getting blown off that. That'll surprise you. Yeah. That, that, 
I didn't know what was happening. Um, yeah, no, that 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 threw me off big time. But other than that, it was it was great. Um, I liked the cleanup scene after that though. It was very mm. dude. Dude knew what he was doing. He knew what was oh doing. yeah, the wolf. The wolf. Great character. The wolf. <laughs> so good. Okay, so the question I was going to ask in the beginning, okay, which I should have written down. So where does Vincent dying fall in line? Where does the butch stuff happen? Okay, so most of the movie takes place the day that they go and get the briefcase, right? right. Mm -hmm. Then it during Butch's story, right. we jump forward a week to the night of the fight. Okay. And that's why um, when they're uh, the night of the fight um, after Butch has killed the guy and run away, Vincent and Mia meet up for just a, a bit behind stage mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they're you know, obviously very awkward when they see each other. Um, and yeah, so it's it's a week after everything else. Oh, that makes, that makes sense. Interesting. Yeah, time. Yeah. And that's that's why um, Marcellus is there with Vince instead of him being there with um, Jules. Oh yeah. Yeah, Jules. Jules is quit and he's walking the earth. Of Vincent course. stays behind, keeps doing the same thing, and ends up dying. Um, that all that all, that makes so much sense why he wasn't there. Oh, it all it all it all clicks. Yep. Interesting. So the, like, Vincent was just by himself in Butch's apartment. Like, I mean, I suppose he's, like... Marcellus left to get donuts. Oh, duh. Okay, okay. That's why he, that's why he was just randomly walking. Okay, yeah. okay. Yep. This all makes sense now. <laughs> that scene afterwards, the car crash scene, and then the scene where they duke it out in the pawn shop. Mm -hmm. That, GTA. That just reminded me of something <laughs> that you would do in GTA. Like, just crashing into a random car and then, like, randomly shooting and Marcel shooting the woman. Like, that. that yeah. is GTA shit right there. <laughs> I, it, I love the, the reveal in that of, like, he stopped at the light, you see the guy, like, walking across, and, like, he turns around to look at him, <laughs> and then it does the reverse shot where you see the Band-Aid on the back of his head, and you're like, oh, shit, that's the guy. Because you, you haven't seen Marcellus's face at that point. Why yeah. does he have the band-aid? Is there a reason? Or just he got Okay. The oh, <laughs> so, oh <laughs> there are some theories. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> it pertains so the actual reason why he has the band-aid on the back of his head is that um Ving Rames had got like his he got like nicked shaving and there was a cut mm. there that they okay. covered up. Um and then obviously like uh they thought it was like a, a cool way to introduce the character because it's um you get to introduce the character with the band-aid and then you get the reveal of marcellus walking across the street with the band-aid so they just kind of went with it mm -hmm. um there are some theories that it pertains to what's in the briefcase <gasps> okay. so and this is this is like this is like classic um early 2000s 2010s like internet film talk like this was this is like a very there are so many youtube th uh, videos about this <laughs> um there is like an old chinese legend about like the soul being like like removed through the back of someone's neck mm -hmm. and so this theory is that Marcellus Wallace's soul is in the briefcase. <laughs> and that's why he has the scars that they took it out of his. Yeah, it's so weird and dumb. That's <laughs> bizarre. Yeah, it is. It really is. It reminded me of Agent 47. Because he's got the barcode on the back of his head. Mm, this yeah. is this Pulp Fiction's Agent 47. I mean, they even sort of work this way. They really kill people. And they do things like that. But yeah, no. I, I <laughs> When you first, when like that, where you just see the back of his head in the beginning, it was like, what's going on with the band-aid? But no, I, that, 
that makes sense. I, I guess the soul maybe it's not. it's it's very dumb, it's but it dumb. is it's one of those it's one of those things of just like those just like those like YouTube film theory, <laughs> Matt Pat, you know, fucking bullshit kind of things that people get obsessed with. Of course, I'll do it. <laughs> what? So like, is is the bar where in the beginning? Is that what is there significance to the bar? Is it just a random bar? Is it the front? Is it like the Sopranos like bada bing? Like is that the front? Is the I would bar? assume so, yeah. yeah. That's it. I I'd assume that Marcellus owns it and he's like running stuff out of there. It's a, you know, laundering thing or whatever. There you go. Um oh something I noticed about the opening credits. Did you recognize the font the font choice when it went through the everyone's names? No, I, I'm not a font guy, so... That is the Stranger Things font. Oh, really? Yeah, um, I, I cross-checked it because the H, the line is up higher. It's like, oh, shit, it is the... It's That's Stranger interesting. Things. Yeah, because um, I, I always just thought it, it was, like, most things with, like, a specific font. They made it specifically for the show, but no, yeah, no, it was it's the... Oh, you know what? That actually makes a lot of sense. Because um, the Stranger Things font is ripping off Stephen King, like, paperback oh. covers, right? Oh, right. And Pulp Fiction, the, the idea is that this is an old pulp magazine right. made into a movie. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, it starts with the definition of the word pulp at the beginning. And so the the... The credits is like the cover of a Ooh. an old magazine, so it, it's very much like the same like paperback novel kind of thing. That's cool. Oh, how interesting. Neat. Neat. Love fonts. Shout out to fonts. I don't know if there's like a study of fonts, but if there is, yeah, there's there's got to be people who study fonts. Fontology. <laughs> I want to be a fontologist. Um. Also, the opening credits. Um, I loved the soundtrack in this movie. It's really good. <laughs> it's so good. It's really, really good. It's one of the 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 things Qu Quentin Tarantino is the best at. Is his soundtracks are always so good. Um, the the movie starts with Miserlou by Dick Dale and the Deltones. Mm -hmm. One of the first concerts I ever saw was Dick Dale. Um, <laughs> That's so specific. Great. Dick Dale puts on a hell of a concert. I don't know if I don't know if he's still touring now, but if you can go see Dick Dale, go watch him. He's awesome. Um, and then it, and then yeah, it does the the radio um, seeking, and it goes to Jungle Buggy. Awesome. Yes, cool in the gang. Yeah. Which the uh, Marcellus does the uh, <laughs> yeah, and I, we're cool in the gang. <laughs> I replayed that a couple of times because, like, I wonder if the subtitles even does like the K and the it does. It was, <laughs> I, it was so, it's, it was so smooth. I loved it. It's oh, cool in the gang. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm curious what. I mean, you you talked a little bit about your history with the movie, but like, what made you watch it first and then? So. So when I was in high school, I was in a band, right, with my uh, my best friend Daniel, sure. and we would like we'd get off school and we'd go to my cousin's house, who was in the band, and we would have like a couple hours of waiting around in between school and band practice. And Daniel kind of was like, he was starting to get into movies, right? And so we just kind of made it like a habit. It was like, okay, we get off, we have this time, let's just go watch a movie or whatever. And I think like the first one we had done was um we were we were like going through like classic 90s films or whatever we watched like boondock saints which was pretty good and then the next day they had a copy of pulp fiction there and we had both heard about pulp fiction so we said okay the next day we're gonna go watch pulp fiction and it was awesome <laughs> soup like what watching this movie when you're in high school is like you know i'm a sophomore in high school watching this for the first time like holy shit this movie's okay awesome I was say, pivotal yeah yes. and then like i think we i we watched it like later again that week too because we were just like <laughs> you know because we, we were confused by it the first time we watched it and stuff right. and we're just like, watch it again like like now that we kind of understand what's going on or whatever and yeah it, it like 
this movie just like really blew me away in terms of like, um, like I said, it's like the first like real like it felt like a real film that I just watched. You know, I felt like they were doing weird stuff in this movie. You know, (laughs) there's like a weird black and white sequence in the middle of it and stuff. And the editing's kind of crazy. And there's the dialogue is super quippy and memorable and stuff. It's just there's a whole lot. And I mean, watching a Tarantino film is a bit like going to a film school for a day because so much of his filmmaking is referencing older films and stuff and, you know. Uh, it's, it just like, it really like got me into movies watching this Mm -hmm. when I was in high school. Um, and then like, yeah, immediately, like I watched the behind the scenes thing of it and then watched Reservoir Dogs, which is arguably a better movie than this. Um, and yeah, I was just like, I got super into this and then it was like, maybe a year or so later that Inglorious Bastards was coming out and I watched that in theaters and that movie blew my mind again that movie's incredible um yeah and like like for a while like you know most most dudes who watch tarantino movies in high school quentin tarantino was like my favorite director for a while film bro month you know (laughs) um yeah uh uh, this this used to be like my favorite movie for a long time Mm -hmm. interesting yeah it yeah i like i said i had no prior knowledge really of this movie um which but like yeah i can definitely see like this being big with high schoolers and yeah. like why because <laughs> like I, I i could definitely see like kids in my class if i had paid attention to what they were saying more i'm sure they probably talked about this movie if they, um but yeah no it, it, i mean it's still it's damn good it's i think it's good stuff it's, um I lost my train of thought. <laughs> I was going somewhere. Train stopped. <laughs> uh oh. It's not good. We're doing we There's real? there's a lot of just really cool filmmaking in this movie. Like I'm gonna do this every time we cover a Tarantino movie, but there is a split diopter shot in this movie. I oh, love those. Of course. You know about the split diopter, McKenna? No, I was just going along with the time. Okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, sp- a split diopter is, it was sort of like a new f- lens in the 70s, right? And um, mm-hmm. filmmaker Brian De Palma, <laughs> super, super into the split diopter shot. Like Brian De Palma used the, sh- like obvi- honestly overuses them. Um, but what it is, is it's a lens that is essentially broken apart into two lenses that can move so that you can get the entire frame in focus, right? But it creates this little, like, a bit of, like, a blurry line on on the the lens and stuff. Some people really don't like them. I really, really like them. (laughs) I think that, like, I think, like, every film should have, like, one split diopter shot if it's really done right. And this one is um, when Butch gets the samurai sword and he busts into the room, you know, where the guys are raping Marcellus or whatever. It's a close-up shot on the the first guy, and then in the background is Butch standing behind the door, and that's a split diopter shot, and it's oh, it looks really, really cool in this. Because obviously Bruce Willis is standing super far away, but he's in focus, and the guy's in focus. It's awesome. <laughs> that's sweet. Oh, I gotta go look at that. I gotta go look at it. At least that uh, frame. Um, oh, shit. That's cool. Oh. Uh, I don't know. I, I love shit like that. It's uh, the editing, filming, technique. Mm, it's good stuff right there. Um, oh, wow. Guess what? The train's gone again. <laughs> the train's gone again? <laughs> the train's gone again. <laughs> it's, it's... Um, I, I do... I, I like at one point um, that... <laughs> Essentially, they're walking to Brett's apartment in the beginning, and they're talking about Mia or whatever. And they're like, yeah, she did a pilot for pilot season. Jules like just explained the whole pilot yeah. process. Yeah, I, just, I was like, oh, and it was in the beginning of this movie. I was like, oh, this movie is gonna be fun, and um, it, it takes a turn. Real that quick. is that that is very very Tarantino mm-hmm. to just like this. This is the like 
Reservoir Dogs almost doesn't feel like a Tarantino movie in spots. Like it obviously it has the famous opening diner sequence. And then after that, it really tones down on like the Tarantino like discussions. This movie's fucking full. Of it. This is like Quentin Tarantino really got to go full on his whole deal in this movie. Because like, yeah, obviously it opens with the Royale with cheese scene, which is very famous. That that whole discussion. Um and then, yeah, it goes into, and yeah, Jules just stops the movie for a second to explain what a pilot is to the audience. <laughs> like, Tarantino is so into just referencing stuff and talking about pop culture or whatever that, yeah, he will stop his movie to be like, if you don't know how, po- if you don't know how TV shows get made, this is how TV shows get made. Isn't that fun? Didn't you feel like you learned something today? <laughs> And then they, they talked about the pilot that she was in later. Like, it came up a couple more. And I was like, oh, that's... This This movie's pretty good about it. Like, sometimes Tarantino's movies can be, like, overindulgent in the dialogue and very much be like, yeah, okay, you just want to fucking talk about stuff for a while, man. This one I actually think is very good in terms of, like, letting you, like, know about the characters by the things that they're talking about. Like, mm-hmm. um... One of my favorite things, I talk about this all the time with this movie, is like people talk about like the Royale with cheese scene and stuff. And they they talk about it as like, here's just this random thing in the movie. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't like move the plot forward or like teach you about the characters or anything. It's just um, people talk about it in terms of that it's this, a thing that wasn't done in movies before, which is here are these two hitmen and on their way to going to do the hit, they're they're normal guys. They're not like cool special guys. Like they talk about the same bullshit you do and then they go kill a guy. And that's like, that's a weird juxtaposition. That's something you haven't seen before. But it actually, I think it is quite, I think it's really good character development for the character of Vincent because Vincent is a dude who like, the th- he comes back from Europe and like, it seems like he just ate at McDonald's the entire time he was in Europe. Like he's this weird, like, just like, and like there's there's a scene cut out from the movie later on where they talk about um Mia talks about like there's two kinds of people Beatles people and Elvis people and that um J- uh, Vince is an Elvis guy which there's still a reference to that in the movie that didn't get cut out so this she just calls him an Elvis man without the explanation of what that is um but it is that like Vincent is a guy who tries to be like classy and smart he's always reading that weird book um yes <laughs> yeah but yeah he goes to france and eats at mcdonald's <laughs> why do we know why he was in europe or he's just hanging out he just he went to europe for a couple of years is what right they, what, like yeah he just he just went to go hang out in europe for a while i wouldn't do that it and it, it part of it like um Tarantino wrote this movie while he was in Amsterdam. Uh, and right. so part of it is just like wanting to talk about things he saw in Europe. <laughs> of course. Um, why? It's, it's, why? Why did Vincent take out Mia? Because. Yeah, no. Why? Why did Vincent take out Mia? Because like it was such a big deal with the, the feet thing with the other dude. And Marcel threw him off a balcony, but then he was like, yo, Vincent, take my wife out, you know? But wh- why? <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> Is that my internet? That might be my internet. I don't know. You might be back. <laughs> this is great. Oh. <laughs> okay, I'm back. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> Can I flip the cameras? Yeah, yeah there we go. <laughs> okay. Now I don't know where they cut off. <laughs> I, I I I I I heard the question. Um, we're gonna pretend like nothing happened. Of course. <laughs> this is amazing. 
editing. Editing. Uh, yeah, it's going to be like this for a while. Um, oh, no. So the reason he takes out Marcellus's wife um, is because he asked him to. Um, it's not 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 really elaborated on. Okay. So, so like one of the reasons that it's like a plot point in the movie is that apparently that it's like a, um, it was like a trope in old, um, like hard boiled like magazines or whatever. Like a gay, like the boss asks a guy to take his mm. wife out on the town or whatever, and then something happens. So like that's that's what a lot of, a lot of this movie is is like recycling. Not necessarily recycling plots, but th like throwbacks to like hard boiled detective magazines or whatever. Like initially the idea was that it was going to be a um I think the magazine was called Black Mask. Mm. It was going to be like an official Black Mask movie, which was a um like a serialized pulp magazine from like the fifties. And so a lot of the stories and stuff are somewhat taken as like tropes from those kind of magazines. Mm -hmm. Ooh, that's fun. I like that. Yeah. Um. Well, yeah, because it was it was like, oh yeah, this is from Marcellus threw the dude off the balcony. Yeah, you never you out. never find out you never find out what that was actually about. Oh yeah, that's true. Oh, yeah. So then, how... Like... And what... So I know they said that the Brett dude was a business partner. So, like, what... what? <laughs> okay, so, yeah. yeah so the, 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 the briefcase. We should talk about the briefcase. Let's talk about the briefcase. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the briefcase is a MacGuffin. It's... It isn't, like, we don't know what's in the briefcase... Nobody knows what's in the briefcase. It, Tar Tarantino has said there is essentially nothing in the briefcase. It is something that is important to move the plot along place to place. Originally, it was going to be the diamonds from Reservoir Dogs that they steal. Mm -hmm. But he decided against that because he wanted the cool, like, open up, reveal, golden briefcase thing. Which I think is a reference to the Maltese Falcon. Ooh. Um, okay. But, um... Yeah, it's like they say business partner. It's they were doing crimes together. They were supposed to deliver that briefcase to Marcellus Wallace. They decided to run off with it, which is why he sends them to go. Oh, oh, yeah. oh. Yeah. Makes sense. Okay. So then the dude that gets his head blown off, why did they bring him along? Like, uh, didn't Jules know him? Or was he just coming along? Like, he's, he's their informant. He's the informant! He's the guy who told them where the guys were, what was going on. Yeah. You really thought there was going to be something going on with that dude in the bathroom, and then he just sucked at shooting. He Did he? Oh, well, Did a miracle you know, actually happen? Did a miracle actually happen? That's the real question here. I, th I, I, bl I believe the intent of the film is that, yeah, because especially because, like, w once Jewel steps away, you can see that there's a bullet hole in the wall directly behind him. Oh, okay, maybe a miracle did yeah. happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I do just, like, it starts off, that part starts off with the dude in the bathroom. He thinks it's going to be this giant thing. He takes shots, and then it cuts to nothing. Yeah, <laughs> no one and, then, him, and then then the uh, yeah the 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 famous shot of Jules and Vince with the guns that gets referenced in Space Jam of all movies. <laughs> really? <laughs> Why? How? I've never seen it. It's Space Jam. in in the final game of Space Jam. It's like Yosemite Sam and somebody else. They're in the full on like they are dressed up as Vincent and Jules from Pulp Fiction, and they can shoot guns. It's so weird. I remember watching that as a kid and having no idea what it was from, and then watching Pulp Fiction being like, wait, is that fucking <laughs> Looney Tunes? That's a scene from Space Jam. Yeah. There were, there, yeah, there was a bunch of things like that where it's like, oh, I've seen that before on the internet, 
<laughs> yeah. come from Pulp Fiction. There's a lot of that. Uh, especially from that apartment scene. Because, like, always the the one with the two of them, and then... Oh, no, I guess the one with John Travolta looking lost is in the house. Oh, yeah, when he walks in the house, he's... <laughs> yeah, I... <laughs> yeah, great, <laughs> great meme. So, so good. <laughs> very, very meme But that, that apartment scene is one of uh, Samuel Jackson's, like, best scenes ever. <laughs> Because like those those lines could be like really really stupid coming out of somebody else's mouth, but the way he delivers like the, uh, do they speak English in what? <laughs> oh yes, <laughs> dude, that dude just, he just, it just, he just, uh, kept saying what? He's like, bro, he told you not. To. Does Samuel he J- look like a bitch? <laughs> so good and i just like so like jules is talking to him eating the cheeseburger or whatever just john travolta is in the background just looking for the briefcase <laughs> yeah <laughs> like that he's... whole that whole scene is just so good mm, this is a tasty burger <laughs> dude on the couch just hanging out it's so good it's fucking seven before eight a.m. and they're just eating burgers. I mean, that's that's the life to live right yep. there. <laughs> um, and then oh, Christopher Walken just randomly showing up for a scene. Yeah, for the watch. <laughs> I have seen a handful of Christopher Walken things, and he really does talk like that in every single thing that I've seen him in. It's- <laughs> He's he's really re- like the way that that scene turns <laughs> is so good. Where it starts off as him just telling this story to this kid, this like really emotional story about this watch, and then all of a sudden he's just like just talking about shoving a watch up his ass. <laughs> like oh man, he he kills that scene so well. Like delivering that monologue, it's so good. <laughs> I I and then uh, Butch has the line. When he's looking for the watch, and he's like, "You know what my father had to do to keep me to get, get me this watch?" <laughs> it's like, "Oh, we know what he had to do. We know what a bunch of people had to do." Was, oh my! <laughs> then I also, I also like um, when when Butch and his lady friend, who her name is also escaping me, and she kept calling the motorcycle a motorcycle. He's like, "It's a chopper, baby. It's a chopper." <laughs> yeah. like, have, like three times. Like, come on, it's a chopper. Come on, it's Grace. <laughs> Zed's dead. Zed's, Zed's dead. Oh my god, that's a, yeah. A lot of turns taken in this movie that I wasn't expecting, and I went in expecting no, well, not nothing, but I didn't know what to expect going into it. It's it's a whole lot of movie. It, it is really a whole is. Lot of movie. It's only two, and, or I say it's only two and a half hours. It's two and a half hours, and you're you're watching like six different movies. Yeah, <laughs> you really are. <laughs> um, do you do you have any particular notes that that you would? Um, let me see. I, I talked about a couple of things I already had in my notes here. Um, oh, just a little inconsistency. I noticed uh, Jules calls his his gun uh, Mister Nine Millimeter. When he's explaining the thing, that that he's very obviously holding a 1911, which is a 45, not a nine millimeter. Inconsistencies. Oh. Oh. Come on, be better. You know? Yeah, come on. <laughs> um, that that the ending scene is really, really good. Really mm. puts a button on the movie. Um, yeah. The start and finish of this movie are both just like really like the the opening like really like catches your attention because mm-hmm. it starts off just like just a normal conversation and then like yeah oh they're gonna rob the place like that's <laughs> it's really good and then yeah the the way to close out the movie um, awesome awesome mm-hmm. way to end your movie <laughs> good good movie good the bad good. motherfucker wallet very cool uh, which apparently is Quentin Tarantino's <laughs> really wallet. yeah. Of course it is. <laughs> uh, I, uh, yeah, I, uh, them in, in that 
like Vincent and Jules in in those outfits too, while trying to like. <laughs> yeah, when they like like they, they pause and like they tuck their guns into the, <laughs> the shorts yeah i love that so much and, and like in towards the beginning when they're in the bar i think it was the bartender was like why, why are you with those clothes it's been a day <laughs> like, yeah oh and then when like they 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 put the clothes on for the first time and they're making fun he's like it's your clothes motherfucker <laughs> A so good. Game. Oh, it's <laughs> love it. So good. Yeah. So good. Really good movie. Um, do you have any final thoughts about Pulp Fiction? This is this is one of those things we've talked about before, where it's just like when a movie's just like generally good. There's <laughs> there's not a lot to talk about. It's just a good movie. It's a good movie. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. That's that's why like. I have so many thoughts, but I only wrote down four things on my napkin that I ripped halfway through the movie, um, because it's a shitty napkin, um, but I was just so enthralled the entire time, I was like, I- Yeah, it's, it's literally either we, we do this where we just kind of, like, talk about a couple things that stay, stay out to us, you know, or it's that we go through every single plot point of the movie and we're here for three hours. Um, and you don't come to HBO Max to hear us talk about, like, the plot of the movie or whatever. No. So, yeah. Plot it's just There's other um, places you can go for plots. Yeah. Just a banger of, banger of a movie. Banger of a movie. Heard Holds up for the most part. I mean, obviously, we should talk. There's just some problematic elements in the movie. Yes. You know? Yeah. yeah. A lot of, um... A lot of things you shouldn't say. Yeah. yeah. No. That and and a- what, what, what's really the, the problematic element of the movie is Tarantino puts himself in the movie and says some things that he probably shouldn't say, you yeah. know? Um, yeah. Yeah. So there's it's it's def, it's definitely, you know, Tarantino movies do that. Tar- yeah. Tarantino has some very problematic stuff in his movies. There's some weird foot fetish stuff in this yep. movie. Yep. Yeah. I, I was reading while I was going through the IMDb page. It was like uh, the director's whatever trademarks or whatever, and there was like four things, and two of them were about yep. feet. <laughs> yeah, Tarantino's real into feet. Yeah, Spend and that a is a whole lot of time looking at Uma Thurman's feet in this movie. Yes, yes. Which sidebar? Because I mean, apparently I do this with every actor that we. Uh, I've seen one Uma Thurman movie before this, and it was Gattaca. Gattaca. <laughs> Very I'm different look- film. Very different. <laughs> this is. I had to look up the it, how, if if this was before or after Gattaca. It's three years before Gattaca, um, but I was like, okay, yeah, no, this is <laughs> Uma Thurman. Very different in the yep. two movies. Then of course the, the Fall Out Boy song. I know that. Which I is that a reference to this movie? Which Fall Out Boy song? It's like uh, Uma Thurman. <laughs> Is uh, it was the big popular one from American Beauty, American Psycho. Um, uh, like, it dance maybe like Uma Thurman is like oh, the chorus, then like, then yeah, yeah probably like yeah yeah. Um, because I was watching, I was like, oh my god, I think this might this might be the thing. Yeah, that um, seems about right for Fallout Boy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Um, yeah, good movie. Yeah, go watch it. Good movie. Um. What are we doing? Memento next? Yes. Okay, we're gonna do another movie that's told out of order. Oh sweet! Oh, I can't. Yeah. I now similar but not similar at all to Pulp Fiction. I know absolutely nothing about Memento, except for Good. I think I've heard you talk about it a few times in reference to another movie, but I don't remember what movie it was hmm. refer- in reference to. Uh, I'll let you know next week. Okay. If, yeah. If we'll I try to put that together. <laughs> yeah, I will too. <laughs> We'll see what happens. Um, where can people find you on the internet? Uh, at Jose Ruckus all over the place. Twitch, Twitter, Instagram. You know the deal. All over the places. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Potterpants212. Link in my bio for other things. Or you can just scroll through my timeline. And there's a few things that I've guessed it on that you can find me if you want. Yeah. You should because the... The podcasts are good. I mean, I'm there, but, like, the podcasts are good. Um, you can follow the show on Twitter at HBO Max, HBO M-A-K-S. 
um, all your podcast feeds and the YouTubes. Um, what should people comment? Uh, they should comment, God damn, Jimmy, this is some real gourmet <laughs> shit. <laughs> Real fans, yeah, re- real HBO yeah. Max fans. <laughs> We're watching. <laughs> right, uh, thanks for watching. Um, come back next week for more film bro things. Yeah.